Stones with murky origins are often attributed to the Romans, but the strength of the legends associated with them might suggest a more ancient and ingrained tradition. There are several interesting examples in the UK, and here I'm going to delve into the facts about three of them. Let's start with the London Stone. I've gone really deep on this one because I love old maps and texts. If you want to find out more, links to the papers I've read on it are in the description below. The Survey of London from 1598 is really illuminating. So what is the London Stone? The small limestone block measures 53 by 30 centimetres and is 43 centimetres in height. Geologists have confirmed it must have been quarried from the inferior oolite zone between Dorset and the Wash. The top has two grooves running through it that must have been carved at some point. For all of its recorded history until very recently, it stood in Cannon Street in the city of London, which was called Candlewick Street in the medieval period. Although small, it was once much bigger, and due to its appearance in old maps and texts, it seems it's been important since medieval times, but no one knows why. It's not clear where it came from, how old it is, or what its original function was. The geology of the actual stone is known, but it has been artificially worked, so must have been part of a structure or something. As I always say, where there's a gap in knowledge, there's room for speculation, and several myths and legends have been built up around the London Stone. Let's take a chronological approach and see what is known about this enigmatic piece of rock. The earliest text to mention it talks about the donation of a property to Canterbury Cathedral by an Eadwacker at Lundinstein. So in this instance, it's referring to it more as a place name rather than discussing the stone itself. It's used as a way of identifying the person who gave his property away. This text dates to the late 11th or early 12th century. Another text in 1135 talks about a fire which started at the house of someone called Aylward near the London Stone. So once again, it's referred to as a landmark, but its function and history are not mentioned. It features on the copper plate map of London dating to 1560. This is its earliest appearance on a map, but this is also the oldest proper map of London, so it says nothing of its antiquity. In the survey of London written in 1598 by John Stowe, he says that on the south side of this high street, near unto the channel, is pitched upright a great stone called London Stone, fixed in the ground very deep, fastened with bars of iron, and otherwise so strongly set that if carts do run against it through negligence, the wheels be broken and the stone itself unshaken. He also features it on a map in this book as number 17. Stowe goes on to talk about its mysterious origins and its earliest mentions, but doesn't agree with any of the legends associated with with it. In these early maps, it was shown across the road from St. Swithin's Church, which sat on the north side of Cannon Street. When this was destroyed in the Great Fire of 1666, Christopher Wren rebuilt it and the stone was eventually moved across the road to sit by its main door. This church was also damaged severely during World War II, leading to its demolition in the early 1960s. In this photograph, the stone preserved in encasing can be seen following the demolition of the church. Every building to be constructed on the site since then has incorporated the stone in some sort of protective casing on its front side. However, it's now been moved to the Museum of London. The myths and legends around it date to medieval times onwards. There's some legend that it was a druidic altar, possibly for human sacrifice. Firstly, the whole idea of the Druids having practiced human sacrifice has been largely debunked. Secondly, there's very little evidence for a pre-Roman presence in London. In fact, if we want to see the stone as the remnants of a megalithic monument dating to the Neolithic or Bronze Age, we'll struggle to find evidence for much activity at this part of the Thames Valley during those periods. And the same goes for the Iron Age, the time of the Druids. There's some evidence for a Mesolithic timber structure and a Bronze Age bridge, but all in all, the area doesn't seem to have been inhabited in prehistory. There's also some idea that it gave medieval kings and queens powers, that it represents the very centre of the original London, and that its fate is entwined with the city itself, the latter meaning it cannot be moved for fear of something dreadful happening. Unfortunately, there's no evidence to support any of these 
ceremonial, geographical, or magical suggestions. Another rather fun legend surrounds the Historia Regum Britannia, written around 1136 by Geoffrey of Monmouth. In this pseudo-history of Britain, Geoffrey says that Brutus, a descendant of the Trojan War hero Aeneas, landed in Britain after various adventures around the Mediterranean and became its first king. He supposedly landed at Totnes in Devon, hence why there is a stone there called the Stone of Brutus, before moving into the Thames Valley to found New Troy, which eventually became London. It's the latter part of this story that may have inspired the London stone to be called the Stone of Brutus, a stone set up by the first king when he founded the city. Of course, Geoffrey's work is now known as pseudo-history for a reason. Much of it has been debunked as rather fantastical or, at the very least, an elaboration on real historic facts. Plus, at no point does he mention a stone of Brutus, not in Totnes and not in London. The most likely scenario is that it belonged to a first century Roman building. This type of limestone has been brought to London for building works ever since Roman times. In the 1960s, a large site was excavated close to the London stone, which archaeologists think was a Roman palace, probably that of the governor of Britain. The results of its excavations were published by Peter Marsden in the transactions of the London and Middlesex Archaeological Society in 1975. According to this report, the hillside overlooking the Thames where the palace was built was artificially terraced in the middle of the first century. A large building was then constructed, which included enormous reception halls, an ornamental garden, a large pool, a small pool and various other rooms. The site covered the area south of modern day Cannon Street, east of Dowgate Hill, north of Upper Thames Street and west of Lawrence Putney Lane. At that time, the palace would have overlooked the River Thames since the shoreline was further north. The Walbrook River, which is now underground, would also have run along the western wall of the palace complex. In the report, Marsden suggests that the London Stone may have been part of a monumental entrance leading into the Roman Palace, especially since it sits on the north-south axis of the site. I've attempted an image overlay on Google Earth here. As you can see, it covered what's now... Cannon Street Underground Station. It does seem like the best explanation. However, if it was part of a Roman palace, I find it strange that its veneration lasted 2,000 years simply because it was part of an entrance to a posh person's house. Not a temple or a shrine or a mithraeum, just a large house. Incidentally, it's not that far from the London mithraeum but there's no known connection. Another rather fascinating stone with mysterious origins is the Stone of Scone in Edinburgh, Scotland, also referred to as the Stone of Destiny, the Coronation Stone, Jacob's Pillow Stone, and the Tannist Stone. Made of red sandstone, the earliest known history of it places the stone at Scone Abbey in the medieval period before it was moved to England after Edward I's invasion in 1296. For hundreds of years, it was then used for the coronation of the English monarchs who eventually became kings and queens of the United Kingdom. It was last used for the coronation of Elizabeth II in 1953. In 1996, it was returned to Scotland and is now kept with the Scottish crown jewels in Edinburgh Castle. Geologists have determined that the red sandstone it's made of is from the area where the Scone Abbey once stood, giving a local origin for it. However, legends place its origins in all sorts of places, from the biblical lands to Tara in Ireland. In fact, one story has it that the Lear Fall, or Stone of Destiny, in Ireland, which tradition maintains was used for inaugurating kings, was brought to Scotland and became the Stone of Scone. But I don't know how this explains the fact there's still a Stone of Destiny on Tara Hill in Ireland. There isn't much more information on it, just like the London Stone, it must have been pretty important at some point for it to have become the stuff of legends and to have been used in coronations, but its origins are now obscure. The Langstein is another mysterious stone, but with more megalithic proportions than the London Stone or the Stone of Scone. It's made of granite, is 1.8 metres tall, and is located on a street corner in Aberdeen. Since the bottom is somewhat pointed, it's possible it was once a megalith pushed into the soil. Scotland has many men here in stone circles, so I think the chance of a prehistoric origin for this one compared to the others is quite likely. But how it ended up in Aberdeen isn't known. It's thought possible that it was reused at some point as a boundary marker. 
In modern times, its name has been engraved into it. Strangely enough, a lot of places in the area seem to be named after it, implying some level of importance in the past. In a 1746 map of the borough of Aberdeen, it's shown in its current location. But at that time, that particular area wasn't urbanized. It was part of the countryside to the west of Aberdeen. In the map, you can see the stone located in a field on the edge of a road near a windmill. It's not part of a stone circle and isn't associated with any other Neolithic structure. Perhaps it was a prehistoric menhir and that was its original location when the area was just fields. Maybe it was then preserved as the area became more urbanized because of these prehistoric origins. So there you have it, three strange stones with obscure origins. Maybe they all date back to the Neolithic, maybe not. But if the London stone is Roman, I do think it must have been part of a shrine or something more than a palace entrance. What do you think? Have you heard or read anything extra to all of this about the London stone, the stone of Scone or the Langstein? Let me know in the comments. If you're still watching, then please hit the like button. I want to say a big thank you to my patrons. If anyone else wants to join my Patreon community, the link is in the description below. Come and find me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, where I'm posting all the time. I've also got a website with some further information just on the sites I visit myself, megalithhunter.com.